To share more about the future of VR, please welcome Michael Abrash. Good morning. You know, getting up here and talking with you each year is something that I really love. It truly is one of the things that I look forward to. But I have to tell you something. I am sick as a dog. In fact, they're going to be bringing tea out for me, and I apologize in advance because I'll probably have to stop occasionally, take a sip, and try to keep from coughing. Really, I should be home lying in bed. But this is the year that Consumer VR finally launched, and I wouldn't have missed this for anything. It's the culmination of a series of amazing and highly improbable events that nobody would have predicted just five years ago. And yet, this is just the beginning. The really interesting stuff is yet to come. So today, I'd like to talk about the future, starting with one of my favorite quotes. Pretty soon, computers will be fast. <laughs> I started a game developers conference talk with that quote 20 years ago. And I think you'd all agree that computers still aren't fast enough. And yet, they're more than 10,000 times faster now than they were then. We humans have an odd cognitive bias that seems designed to make us perpetually unsatisfied. If I had handed you a system that was even 10 times faster in 1996, it would have been a miracle on the order of loaves and fishes. And yet, all you can think today as you try to hit 90 frames per second is that you wish computers were just a little bit faster. There's a wonderful future, always moving ahead of us, just out of reach. And yet, that cognitive bias serves a very useful function. It gives meaning to our work. We don't often stop and think about it, but what is it that makes work rewarding? Doing interesting stuff and earning a living is necessary, but not sufficient. Truly satisfying work requires a meaningful narrative, one that successfully answers the question, what do I want to accomplish in order to make this a life well spent? I'm pretty sure most of you would have the same answer to that question that I do, to make a difference, to change the world for the better. And making that happen is all about seeing a brighter future ahead. I didn't start out thinking that way. I was a grad student in energy management and policy at Penn when I discovered personal computers by accident and found that they were way more interesting than home insulation programs. <laughs> this was before PCs were a big thing, so I was far more concerned with finding interesting work that paid decently than thinking about the future. And, in fact, it took another 15 years and a meeting with John Carmack before that changed. I told part of that story at the first Oculus Connect, but it's worth telling the full story today. In 1993, I was the manager of the graphics team for the first version of Windows NT. A friend showed me the leaked alpha of Doom. I was blown away, and I sent mail to John saying so. John said we should have lunch next time he was in Seattle, and we did and he offered me the opportunity to work at id. I said no. I was doing interesting work, and I had a lot of stock options. <laughs> a year passed. Sometime during that year, I took my daughter to a bookstore. While she was looking at books, I browsed through the science fiction section, and I noticed an interesting-looking book called Snow Crash. I didn't have much time to read in those days, but I bought it anyway. And partway through it, I had the sudden insight that a lot of the VR in it could actually work. Maybe not right then, or quite the way that Neil Stevenson described it, but close enough at some point in the foreseeable future. And then John visited again. We ate a Thai chef, which miraculously is still there today. <laughs> I knew John was going to ask me to join him again, and I knew I was going to say no again. My work was still interesting, and now that NT had shipped, I had a lot more stock options. <laughs> but instead, John sat down and started spinning his vision of the future, of how he was going to enable people to run their own persistent servers, customize them, extend them, link them together, and over time, a kind of cyberspace would emerge. He talked for two hours, and as he spoke, his vision resonated with snow crash in my mind, and I could actually feel the shape of the future emerging. By the time he finally got around to asking me to join him, that future had taken hold of my imagination. For the first time in my life, I had a sense of purpose beyond just writing great code, and I signed on to help make it happen. 
it was by far the worst financial decision of my life. <laughs> Microsoft stock tripled over the next two years, and then it doubled and it doubled again. And yet, I don't regret my decision for a moment. That vision of the future motivated me to do something challenging and exciting that changed its part of the world in a big way and touched a lot of people's lives. Likewise, I think the biggest reason we're all working on VR now is because of our vision of what VR will become. As VR progresses, that vision will keep evolving too, and we'll always wish it was just a little bit better. But at the same time, all our efforts will be collectively taking VR to the next level. My day-to-day -day work is incredibly interesting, but knowing that I'm helping to shape the future is a big part of what makes these the good old days for me, and I hope it is for you too. Today, I'm going to talk about that future as far ahead as I can see into the fog of time, which is about five years. Science fiction writer El Sprague de Camp said, it does not pay a profit to be too specific. <laughs> Wise advice indeed. However, about three years ago, I made very specific predictions about what VR would be like in two years, and they seem to have pretty much come true. So, emboldened by that, I'm foolishly going to ignore de Camp's advice and make another set of specific <laughs> predictions. I am, however, only going to make a certain type of prediction about the evolution of underlying VR platform technologies such as displays and computer vision. I'm not going to talk about killer apps or what else might be running on that VR platform in five years for a couple of reasons. One reason is that platform technology is what I know the most about because it's what Oculus Research has been focusing on. Content can do only what the underlying technology makes possible, and our mission is to drive that enabling technology forward so that content creators like you can work their magic on top of it. The other reason I'm not going to talk about future VR applications is that I honestly have no idea what we're all going to be using VR for in five years. That doesn't bother me in the least. The potential of VR is obvious, and all of you are already well down the path to creating the apps that will make VR part of our everyday lives. Our goal at Oculus Research is to create the package of technologies that will enable you to do that, and that's what I'm going to pull the curtain back on a little bit today. Frankly, Talking about this in public wasn't an easy decision to make. However, all of you are working on VR right now, at the very beginning, out of faith that it will become incredibly cool and important. And I think you deserve a glimpse of just how bright the future you're working toward is. Of course, I may be wrong on specifics. In fact, I guarantee that I will be wrong about at least some of them. But I'm highly confident that the overall trend is there. Enough of these predictions will come true so that VR five years from now will make today's VR look like something out of prehistory. One day, years from now, you'll fire up your original Rift, just for old time's sake, and it'll bring back great memories. But you'll wonder where your hands are. You'll be oblivious to the real world around you, and it won't look or sound quite as amazing as you remember. You'll go back to your spiffy new Rift, and in that moment, you'll realize just how far we've come in five short years and that you were part of making that happen. And then, of course, you'll start wondering why it's not as good as the holodeck yet. <laughs> so let's look into the future. The technologies I'll discuss fall into several main areas. Optics and displays, graphics, eye tracking, audio, interaction, ergonomics, and computer vision. I'm going to talk about each of these separately, although many of the technologies interact closely, as I'll note in places. I'll talk about where I think each might be in five years and some of the challenges involved in getting there. My predictions are for what will happen on the leading edge, which will be the high end of PC VR. These innovations will make their way to mobile VR over time, but power, compute, and pricing advantages mean the PC will provide the most sophisticated VR experience for a long time. What you're going to hear is what I think and hope VR will be in five years, but everything I'll discuss is still far out research at this point, and may or may not ever show up in a product. So with the clear understanding that these are just my opinions and that there are no guarantees, let's peer into the future. We're primarily visual creatures, so delivering the right photons to the right places on the retinas at the right time is a pillar of VR. 
here's where we are right now. Here's what our visual system is actually capable of. As you can see, there's a long way to go. We'd ideally have eight times the pixel density on each axis, three times the field of view, and variable focus. It's certainly going to take a while to get there. How far can we get in five years? Here are my predictions. Panel resolution is the easiest one, since there's been steady improvement in that for years, and it's fairly easy to extrapolate ahead. I think we'll be around 4K by 4K per eye in five years. However, there's an interesting trade-off in how that resolution gets used. Pixel density is a function of both resolution and field of view. We could have a higher pixel density image with a narrower field of view, or a wider field of view with a lower pixel density image. It all depends on what field of view is achievable and how compelling a wider field of view turns out to be. It's my guess that a wider field of view will be very compelling, greatly increasing presence, and that VR will head toward the widest possible virtual image. Given that, I am predicting a 140 degree field of view, resulting in approximately 30 pixels per degree. Not as sharp as 2020 vision, but good enough to pass a driver's license test. A wider field of view with higher resolution will require a breakthrough in optics. For now, lenses of the sort currently used in the Rift have fundamental limitations with respect to image quality, and both Fresnel's and normal fisheye lenses can't get much past 100 degrees without unacceptable distortion. So new optics technology will be required. I don't know what that enabling technology will be, but I'm confident that we'll find a way to break out well past 100 degrees. The final area for optics and display is depth of focus. The lenses of our eyes normally change shape in order to focus at the correct depth for whatever object we're currently looking at. However, the lenses in VR headsets have a fixed focus at about two meters. So in VR, our eyes would ideally stay focused around two meters, even if we're looking at something right in front of our nose. That's actually great for a presbyope like me, since my eyes are in fact permanently focused around two meters. <laughs> but for those of you with eyes that can actually change focus, it's less ideal. Your eyes end up focused closer than two meters when looking at something up close in VR, causing both near and far objects to be blurred. Is this a big problem? Clearly not, since this is how the Rift works today, and we all use the Rift a lot with good results. But would it be good to fix? Sure, particularly as resolution increases, making blurring more evident. Anything that makes virtual viewing more like the real world will increase comfort and the ability to stay in VR for long periods. So, how might we address this? That's an open area of research. There are several possibilities, including holographic displays, light field displays, multifocal displays, and varifocal displays, but none of them are close to being good enough yet, especially in head-mountable form. At this point, I don't know which of these approaches will work, if any, but the problem feels tractable. So I think that one way or another, VR will have good support for depth of focus in five years. The cumulative effect of depth of focus, higher resolution, wider field of view, and better optics will be VR that is highly comfortable, amazingly realistic, and deeply convincing. Given a great display, the obvious next requirement is graphics to drive that display. And that's not a trivial undertaking when it involves 16 megapixels per eye, more than an order of magnitude more than today at 90 hertz. As it happens, most of those pixels are wasted at any given time because the eye has only a very small area of full resolution. This area, called the fovea, is a mere three degrees across, the size of your thumb at arm's length, and resolution falls off rapidly away from the fovea. The obvious solution is to render pixels with variable density across the scene to match the eye's resolution. This is called foveated rendering, and it can potentially reduce the number of pixels rendered by an order of magnitude or even more. I'm sure all of you can appreciate how much easier it would be to hold frame rate if you only had to render one-tenth the pixels. There are a couple of major challenges with foveated rendering. The first challenge is developing a rendering approach that can take full advantage of foveation. The traditional approach involves multiple passes and drawing a lot more pixels than needed. It may be necessary to redesign the entire graphics pipeline in order to realize the full potential. The second challenge is that foveated rendering requires virtually perfect eye tracking, which I'll discuss next. So, there are certainly obstacles to overcome, but my prediction is that foveated rendering will be a core VR technology in five years. 
Foveated rendering has a critical dependency, however. It can only become a core technology if eye tracking is completely reliable across the full range of eye motion for the entire user population. Because if it fails, visual quality will deteriorate drastically. A number of other potential breakthroughs have the same dependence on great eye tracking. You might think, how hard can it be to track a single convex organ in a confined space? And indeed, when we started Oculus Research, I assumed eye tracking just required some solid engineering. Two years later, I think that's true for tracking well enough to give avatars eyes. But it turns out the tracking at the level required for foveated rendering is not a solved problem at all. One reason is that pupil tracking is a key eye tracking technique like so. Here you can see the pupils are being tracked correctly. But pupils vary wildly, including this and this. And of course, pupils also change size and can even change shape. And here you can see they're not even the same size. Glint tracking off the cornea can help. But then there's the problem of eyelids. Not to mention fitting enough illuminators and cameras into a compact headset and positioning them so that tracking works across the full range of eye motion with deep eye sockets, flat faces, bulging eyes, and LASIK, and is 100% reliable in all those cases. Worse, the eye is not nearly as rigid as you think. The motion at the end is a little subtle, so let's look at it again. Watch the shape of the pupil as the eye stops. This is a problem because what we really want to know is where the image is on the retina. Tracking the outside of the eye can only give us an approximation of that. Ideally, we track the retina itself, but doing that in a headset across the full range of eye motion would require inventing a whole new type of eye tracking technology. Getting to extremely accurate, completely robust eye tracking may only require gathering a lot more data and doing a lot more engineering. Or it may require real research and new technology, but either way, Great eye tracking is so central to the future of VR that I believe it will be solved five years from now. Although, I have to admit, it is the greatest single risk factor for my predictions. Audio is pretty straightforward. Five years from now, you'll be able to quickly and easily generate a personalized head-related transfer function, or HRTF, in the comfort of your own home. HRTFs describe how sound bounces off and diffracts around the head and especially the ears, and personalized HRTFs will provide the same sense of direction and distance for virtual sound that we have for real sound. There will also be technology for modeling the propagation of sound around virtual spaces, how sounds reflect, diffract, and interfere as they bounce around, so virtual rooms will feel much more convincing, even though you may not consciously know why. However, while the theory behind audio propagation is well understood, the computational demands of working implementations are so high that only certain sorts of constrained virtual spaces with limited movement of sound sources and listeners will be practical for propagation in five years. But those instances will be highly compelling and will point the way to steadily improving audio in the future. So far, we've only talked about improving our perception of the virtual world. What about interacting with it? Oculus Touch is so good that I think that it and its descendants are going to be the state of the art for at least five years and maybe much longer. It's quite possible that touch-like controllers could be the mouse of VR and still be the primary interaction technology 40 years from now. The only thing I can see displacing touch-like controllers is the ability to use your hands as direct physical manipulators, as you do in the real world. And I don't see that happening in the next five years because it involves haptic and kinematic technology that isn't even on the distant horizon today. I do think that hand tracking and rendering will become a standard part of VR in the next five years and will be a welcome addition for social interaction. Touch's hand presence is a great addition for VR experience, but avatars that reflect your exact hand movements will be even more personal and expressive. It will also be useful to be able to use hand gestures to control simple interfaces and perform lightweight direct manipulation when you don't want to bother using touch or the simple input device. For example, when you just want to watch a movie in VR. Typing on virtual keyboards overlaid on real surfaces or even floating in midair will also become practical and will be handy. But without haptics and kinematics, the applications of virtual hands will be limited compared to the real world. 
So my prediction is that in five years, we'll see good avatar hand tracking and gesture-based simple interface control, but touch-like controllers will still be the dominant mode for sophisticated VR interactions. In an ideal world, we wouldn't even strap a device onto our head. We'd just walk into the holodeck. We won't be able to do that any time in the foreseeable future, and no, we're not working on it. <laughs> but we can work on making the device more comfortable and the experience better. Ways I think that will happen over five years include reduced weight, better weight distribution, and more convenient handling of prescription correction. But the biggest change I expect to see at the high end is wireless headsets. This is not just a comfort and convenience issue, although it certainly is that. The key is that in conjunction with the computer vision advances I'll discuss next, eliminating the tether will allow you to move freely about the real world while in VR, yet still have access to the processing power of a PC. The challenge here is developing a wireless link with enough bandwidth to meet the needs of VR. There's no existing consumer electronics link that's up to the task at current resolutions, let alone at the 4K by 4K resolution I expect in five years. This is one reason foveated rendering is so important. Without the pixel reduction it provides, it will be very difficult to go wireless on the PC. Most of the technologies I've talked about so far is focused on matching digital input and output to the human perceptual and motor systems. Since that's the only way to get information into and out of our brain until someone comes up with a way to jack in, that, all of that is absolutely critical for a great virtual experience. But there's a real world out there on the other side of our perceptual system, and bringing that into VR would be hugely compelling. We'd be able to move around safely and confidently, pick up coffee mugs, see who just came into the room, be anywhere on Earth we wanted to be, and interact with anyone on the planet. There would no longer be a sharp line between VR and reality. Instead, we'd have a mixed reality that would let us choose whatever elements of each we wanted at any time. I'll call this mixed reality augmented VR. There are many, many aspects to making that work, but the two main themes are sensing and reconstructing the real world in general and virtual humans. Reconstructing the real world is challenging, but doable. You can go out right now and have someone scan a space and give you a model of it. Doing that with a consumer device in real time is another matter entirely, and yet that's what's needed to make augmented VR really useful. My prediction is that five years from now, augmented VR will be an integral part of virtual reality, and that it will transform VR into something that will be used for longer and for many more things than it can be today. While there are many unsolved problems and a lot of research and engineering still needs to be done, augmented VR is so important that I'm confident all the obstacles will be overcome and that the boundary between virtual reality and real reality will progressively blur over the next five years. Augmented VR will be quite different from the mixed reality that's possible with see-through AR glasses. With augmented VR, we will have a full model of the real scene and complete control over every pixel. So we'll be able to modify reality and mix it with the virtual world in literally any way we want. Any part of the scene could be virtual or real, and we could also mix the two closely. For example, changing the colors and textures of real surfaces or warping real textures across virtual surfaces. We could even send a model of a space to someone somewhere else so that location itself becomes virtual. And what would be even cooler would be interacting with them in that space. Other people are the most interesting thing in the world to most of us, and I believe that the development of virtual humans is going to be the single most important factor in making VR a part of our everyday lives, thanks to the social interaction that will enable. It's also perhaps the single most challenging aspect of virtual reality. People are non-rigid and physically highly complex. There are more than 25 degrees of freedom just in one hand. The face is even more complex, and we are incredibly sensitive to the subtleties of gestures and expressions, as well as the fine movements of eyes. The bar here is extremely high, and the technology for real-time capture and reproduction of humans with consumer technology is nowhere near that bar today. At the same time, tremendous progress has been made over the last few years in all aspects of virtual humans. Today, we can do near-perfect hand tracking, but it requires retroreflector-studded gloves and lots of cameras. In five years, though, it should be possible to have avatar hands that are close to this level. Faces are incredibly subtle and complex to reproduce, especially with a headset on, but the technology is getting there.
and real-time markerless body tracking is now a realistic goal. As you can see, machine learning makes it possible to do accurate pose estimation over a very wide variety of circumstances. <laughs> there will be a huge amount of work on virtual humans over the next five years, and we'll certainly see a number of systems that provide a limited experience of being with another human being, basically improved versions of the toy box demo. But like toy box, they will be on the other side of the uncanny valley from truly human avatars, and while they'll be entertaining and useful, you will never for one moment feel like you're in the presence of a true human, much less a specific, unique individual. I think this area is so hard that five years from now, virtual humans will be widely used for social interaction and highly entertaining, but will not yet be convincingly human, and the real breakthrough will be yet to come. So that's a look at the underlying technologies of VR and how I think they'll evolve over the next five years. The obvious next question, of course, is if I'm right, what does that imply for the VR experience five years from now? I said I wasn't going to talk about killer apps or what else might be built on the underlying technology, but I will talk about one application because it's one I personally want and expect to be using in five years. And it shows how all the platform technologies come together to create something that's greater than the sum of its parts. I talked about this application last year. It's a virtual workspace, a VR environment that you could configure any way you wanted, with virtual screens, holograms, whiteboards, and whatever, then switch between configurations instantly. Done well enough, that's the most productive solo work environment I can imagine. And then if we add virtual humans, it would become an amazingly productive group work environment as well. As just one simple example, imagine having a whiteboard session with any number of people you want, no matter where they are, and with an infinite number of whiteboards of any size capable of showing anything from text to images to videos to holograms, all easily searched and archived. Let's look at what it would take to make that happen. First, we need enough resolution and good enough image quality so that virtual monitors can replace real monitors. That obviously requires very high-res displays and much improved optics, but that's just the start. It also requires the ability to render at that high resolution and to transmit the data over a wireless link because you won't want to have to deal with a tether all day while you work, which means we need foveated rendering, which may mean we need a new graphics pipeline and certainly means we need great eye tracking. Next, we need to be able to do augmented VR because we want to be able to see our surroundings in real time so we can move about and interact with our desk and chair and likely also our keyboard, mouse, and beverage of choice. We also need to be able to see our hands in order to be able to interact with the real world and our body so that we can move around with confidence. All that takes great computer vision. And if we're going to be doing work with our hands, we're going to want depth of focus support in order to make that comfortable for hours of use per day. And we'll want proper spatialization and propagation of virtual sound so that virtual objects will sound as real as they look. That's great for solo work. Teamwork requires even more. Obviously, it will require avatars. The more convincing, the better. Less obviously, it will require a wider field of view so that everyone in a meeting can see each other. That's critical for social interaction, as are voices that sound like they're coming from the right people in the right places. Finally, we'll want to be able to share our environments with each other, both for social purposes and because physical objects will often be important to the discussion. In short, a virtual workspace that makes us more productive than the real world requires pretty much everything I've talked about today. Advances in each of the technology areas by themselves will be useful, but together these advances will make it possible to create a system that will revolutionize the way we work. Not all of that will be in place in five years, but I think we'll be far enough along so that we will start doing real work in VR. And while the virtual workspace is the only VR application that I can envision that clearly, I'm highly confident that the advances I foresee over the next five years, combined with the hard work of all of you, will likewise revolutionize gaming, entertainment, education, communications, and more. Together, we're creating the platform that will be the basis for the next few decades of how we work, play, and interact. I'd like to close with one more story. In the summer of 2011, I met with Atman Binstock, now chief architect of Oculus, in this coffee shop in Kirkland, Washington, to try to convince him to come work on VR, AR with me. VR actually came later. 
His first question was, why now? And that was pretty easy to answer. I pointed out how half a dozen technologies were coming together that would collectively make AR feasible. His second question was, why me? As Ottman put it in his blog post when he joined Oculus, after all, if the technology was really ready, surely people more capable than me would figure it out. But Michael convinced me that this was basically the myth of technological inevitability. The idea that because technologies were possible, they would just naturally happen. Instead, the way technological revolutions actually happen involves smart people working hard on the right problems at the right time. And if I wanted a revolution, and I thought I was capable of contributing, I should be actively pushing it forward. Ottman decided that he did want to make a difference and jumped in with both feet to make it happen. And there is no question that VR is much farther along today, coincidentally, five years later, because of that choice. <laughs> Likewise, everyone in this room has jumped in to make VR happen, and our reward is that we are on the leading edge of one of the most important technological revolutions of our lifetime. Thanks to all our efforts, VR is going to leap ahead over the next five years. There's a line in Ottman's quote that I like so much that I'm going to repeat it. And if there's one thing you take away today, this should be it. The way technological revolutions actually happen involves smart people working hard on the right problems at the right time. Take a good look around this room, because when it comes to the future of VR, that, my friends, is us. Thank you. <laughs>